Hi, I'm Kathleen Bickford Burzak, and I'm the Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University. In 1154, the Moroccan geographer Al Idrisi completed his description and map of the known world. The massive work was commissioned by the Norman King Roger II, whose cosmopolitan court on the island of Sicily was strategically placed between Byzantine, Islamic, and Christian societies and drew together merchants, pilgrims, and scholars from across regions. For centuries to come, Idrisi's work stood as the most complete and reliable source for visualizing lands beyond the Mediterranean Sea that were essential to the region's global economy. Following on techniques developed by the Greek scholar Ptolemy, Idrisi visualized the world as a globe. This is a 15th century copy of Idrisi's state-of-the-art map. It's drawn with the Southern Hemisphere at the top, including the continent of Africa, the holy city of Mecca at center, Arabia just below, and Europe to the lower right. The detailed Catalan Atlas is likewise a powerful statement of medieval globalism. Dating to 1375, it's speculated that the Atlas may be the work of the Jewish cartographer Abraham Kresk from the island of Majorca, which is located over here on the map. And it may be that it was commissioned as a gift from the King of Aragon in present day Spain to his cousin, the King of France. Whether or not these details are true, this map or nautical chart visualizes the reach of Mediterranean islands like Majorca at a time when seafaring technologies were becoming more and more advanced. Like Idrisi in Morocco, Majorcan scholars and map makers were well placed to obtain information from travelers about the vast and diverse regions of the world that intersected with their communities through trade. The Catalan Atlas includes lively illustrations, navigational lines, ports of call, and informative notations in the Catalan language. It places the Mediterranean Sea at the center of a system of exchange that stretches in all directions across Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And this is Europe here and Asia all the way to the other side of the map. The Catalan Atlas is rendered from a European perspective and it's notable that it doesn't include illustrations of European rulers, landmarks, and inhabitants as if to underscore that they're not in need of explanation to its users. The Atlas makes clear references to the prominence of West Africa and Trans-Saharan commerce within its global world. In the, and so here's West Africa. And in the lower left corner, you see a veiled man on camelback and wearing green robes. He's identified as a nomad by a caption written, written directly onto the map that also references shields made of oryx antelope hide that were among the valued exports from south of the Sahara Desert. He approaches an enthroned ruler holding a golden orb. The caption proclaims that this man is Mansa Musa, ruler of the powerful empire of Mali, whose wealth comes from the great quantities of gold in his lands. In 1324, 15 years before the Catalan Atlas was created, Mansa Musa, who like many rulers and traders in the region was an adherent to the Islamic faith, made a lavish pilgrimage to Mecca. Musa's journey was chronicled by the Syrian scholar Alumari, who described the ruler's entourage of servants, slaves, and soldiers, the large amounts of gold with which he traveled, his generosity and faith, and the honors he was 
accorded as a visiting dignitary of the highest importance. Today, Mansa Musa is believed by some to be the richest man who ever lived. This lecture will look outward from the Sahara at the medieval world. It's a challenging to topic to document. The Catalan Atlas is unique for giving a face to its importance. The image of Mansa Musa and a trader on camelback further provides a means for thinking about the role of Islamic civilization within this story. Both of these individuals are members of an expanding Muslim world that's united by a unified language and shared beliefs, laws, and values. Islam then, as now, facilitated connections within a multicultural context. I'll begin by situating the medieval world from an African perspective, drawing on examples from the exhibition Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture, and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa, which I organized at Northwestern's Block Museum of Art. I'll provide examples of how the exhibition used archeological fragments from medieval sites around the Sahara as a starting point for making this history visible. Finally, I'll close with a brief look at the partnerships with specialists from across disciplines and with institutions in Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria that made the exhibition possible. Caravans of Gold reanimated the buried history of the medieval period from the perspective of Western Africa. This is a history that has been largely unaccounted for because of ingrained Eurocentric biases about Africa and because its scattered and fragmented remains are undervalued. There are many examples I could call on to represent the widespread European and American disregard for African history, but I'll share two with you now. In the early 19th century, the German philosopher George Hegel referred to Africa as, quote, lying beyond the day of self-conscious history. And in 2007, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, suggested in a speech that Africa, quote, has never really entered history. Caravans of gold used archeological remains as a starting point for bypassing expectations of Africa as a footnote to world history and for making Western Africa's medieval past tangible within the museum. The medieval period is conventionally conceived with Europe at center, while other regions are relegated to Europe's periphery, as demonstrated by the map to the lower right, which was taken from Wikipedia. In contrast, in Caravans of Gold, we presented a decentralized view of the medieval period, visualized by the underlying map. From the perspective of the Sahara, the medieval period begins with the spread of Islam in the eighth century and diminishes with the beginning of Atlantic coastal trade in the early 16th century. Over these years, trade across the Sahara was among the most important forces that fueled a trans-regional economy. Caravans of gold brought focus to the Sahara Desert as the fulcrum of an interconnected world of exchange and touched on the intersections of language, culture, practice, and belief that were activated within this system. The exhibition focused on several archeological sites in Mali and Morocco. The rare fragments that come from these sites, like the ones you see here, help to make the past tangible. They're time travelers that are simultaneously of the past and in the present, and they evoke what's been called the archeological imagination, our ability to imagine the past through its remains. The exhibition relied on four methodologies for interpreting fragments. There was the analysis and study of the material remains themselves, and their comparison with more complete objects of the same period. 
In some instances, these comparisons were also supported by written descriptions of North and West Africa from the medieval period, which are primarily in Arabic. Because the majority of these texts are based on secondhand accounts, and at times include anecdotes that are clearly exaggerated or invented, they're often rejected as a, as a reliable source. It's true that the texts must be read with a critical eye. However, when set side by side with the material record, they can provide important supporting details. Finally, the fragments were reviewed in light of more recent objects and practices that allowed informed speculation based on the continued importance of forms and techniques through time. Each of these methodologies aids us in understanding what the fragments once were. Here are two examples of how this worked. First, let's look at the brass disc on the right, which was excavated from the site of Gao in Mali. In the exhibition, it was presented next to an early 20th century oryx antelope hide shield, which you see on the left. And that shield is embellished with similar discs. In medieval Arabic accounts, Gao is described as a wealthy center of commerce and a royal capital. It's from such trading towns that many goods were amassed for transport across the Sahara Desert including shields. These are referenced in numerous Arabic written accounts. For instance, the Granadan geographer Al-Zuri, writing in the 12th century, noted, quote, these shields are most amazing and are given as, president, as presents to the kings of North Africa and Andalusia. Shields made from the hide of the scimitar oryx a large antelope which prefers the arid environment of the Saharan fringe, were prized because of their strength and durability. It's easy to imagine this brass disc embellishing a shield or another piece of leatherwork which has not survived into the present day. For the second example, the distinctive porcelain clay and light green glaze of the small ceramic fra fragment at center which is no bigger than the nail of my index finger, identifies it as a Qing, as Qing Bei ware, a type of pottery that was produced in China between the 10th and the 14th centuries and widely exported. The fragment was excavated at Tadmecca, Mali, a town that thrived in the same period on the southern fringes of the Sahara. In the exhibition, it was displayed beside a complete Qing Bei porcelain bowl which you see to the right, representing the kind of object that the fragment was once, once a part of. The small piece of medieval Chinese silk was also excavated at the site and was in the same case. Seeing these things side by side provides information that invites us to understand and see the past in our mind's eye in new ways. A desire for West African gold stimulated an increase in trade southward across the Sahara in the medieval period. References to gold trade are found beginning in the ninth century in Arabic accounts about Western Africa, where the exchange of gold for Saharan rock salt, a mineral essential for the well being of humans and animals, was widespread. The Andalusian historian and geographer Al Bakri, for instance, includes this description in his 11th century account of the West African state of Ghana. Quote, on every donkey load of salt, when it's brought into the country, their king levies one gold coin and two when it's sent out. Gold and salt continue to be important commodities in the rigid region today. West African gold processed into ingots and minted into coins became part of a vast economy that reached both northward across the Sahara to Europe in the Middle East and southward into West Africa's forest. 
Gold was also shaped into jewelry using techniques such as filigree, casting, and hammering. Techniques and forms dating to the medieval period have had a lasting presence across North and West Africa. The filigree bead to the left from Egypt or Syria was made using wires and tiny beads of gold that are soldered together in a lacy openwork structure. The one to the right was made in the 19th century in Senegal and was cast in silver with gold plating and details. Gold coins or ingots were pounded into thin gold leaf that was applied to book pages, paintings, ivory boxes, copper work, and other items as lavish embellishments. On religious objects, gold leaf heightened symbolic associations. In the medieval Islamic tradition, gold was the most appropriate material to render the world of God, as in this page from the Blue Quran on the left. And in the Christian tradition, its luminous appearance conveyed a vision of heaven on earth, such as the painting on the right. Ongoing archeology span around the Sahara is providing new information about the Trans-Saharan gold trade. Among the most important finds comes from the Malian Trading Center of Tadmecca. It's long been supposed that West African gold was amassed at trading centers like Tadmecca, where merchants from north of the Sahara came to barter for it with rock salt and goods from north of the, des of the desert. It's been assumed that this gold was transported unprocessed northward across the Sahara to be processed and minted elsewhere. However, Al-Bakri described an element of the gold trade that reorients this expectation. In his book of geography, the scholar describes Tadmecca and proclaims, quote, of all the towns in the world, it is the one most like Mecca. Their coins are called bald because they're of pure gold without any stamp. Al-Bakri's clear assertion here that unstamped gold currency was made at Tadmecca has been disregarded over the centuries. However, recent excavations at the site uncovered the fragments you see to the left of molds for shaping gold into disks of equal weight. The site's lead archaeologist working with material scientists has hypothesized and tested a process for purifying and casting gold based on these remains. Only a few examples of medieval West African gold work have been found. This group of jewelry, including a ring, a pendant, and earrings, comes from the burial of a wealthy individual at a late medieval site in northern Nigeria called Derby Takushe. While the jewelry resembles gold work from Western Africa, it was found buried within a 14th century basin from Egypt, which you see on the right. These objects provide evidence that the city was engaged in long distance trade in multiple directions. West Africa's major gold sources were located near the headwaters of the Senegal and Niger rivers and Trans-Saharan gold trade was controlled by people living in cities and towns of the agriculturally rich inland Niger and middle Niger region on the Sahara's southern fringes. And this is the area of the inland Niger and middle Niger. We can capture a glimpse of the people of these regions who lived at a time when their communities held wealth and power as brokers in the gold trade through terracotta figures like these that were made between the 10th and the 14th centuries. The sculptures depict individuals wearing bracelets, pendants, and arm knives. And this is the arm knife right here and here. Remnants of which are also found in archeological contexts. Similar objects have continued to be made through the centuries. For instance, on the right is an arm knife from the late 19th or early 20th century. 
Terracotta figures also frequently include horses, such as the one at center. While the small breed of horse was local to the region, larger Arabian horses were also imported from across the Sahara, another commodity within circulating networks of exchange that included diverse goods moving in multiple directions for short and long distances. The intriguing figure to the left of a ruler on horseback was excavated at Igbo Ukwu in southern Nigeria. It raises questions about connections between Trans-Saharan trade routes and routes that continued down the Niger River into West Africa's forest region. Proof of such trade is found in the overlapping types of glass beads that have been excavated at Igbo Ukwu and at Gao far upriver. So here's Igbo Ukwu, and if you go up, up, up the river, here's Gao just on the fringes of the Sahara Desert. Because there were no horses in the forest region, this figure raises questions about how, hor how horse and rider imagery developed there. One strong possibility is that horses, or perhaps even an artwork depicting a horse, traveled to Igbo Ukwu as part of long distance trade from the north. Caravans of gold followed medieval Trans-Saharan exchange to its farthest reaches in parts of Africa's forest region within reach of the Niger River, powerful states arose. The city-state of Ife is perhaps the best known of these. A cast copper sculptural tradition thrived at Ife and nearby sites in the 13th and 14th centuries which included the making of naturalistic representations of rulers, such as this exquisite figure of a seated man. The figure is likely made with a mix of copper from nearby sources and from sources as far away as the Sahara Desert and even Europe, copper that circulated across Trans-Saharan trade routes. African elephant ivory was among the materials in high demand in France and elsewhere in Western Europe and the Mediterranean at this time. It's interesting to note that sculptures of elephants were also produced by artists at Ife, such as that on the right. And ivory tusks excavated from medieval graves at multiple sites in the region um, point to the importance of the animal as a symbol of wealth and power. This 13th century ivory figure of the Virgin and Child from France to the left stands over 12 and a half inches tall and is four and one third inches in diameter at its widest point. Ivory sculptures of this size could only have been carved with ivory from an African savanna elephant, which grows the largest tusks. It's easy to imagine that forest elephant ivory was among the commodities that Ife contributed to the far reaching networks of exchange that it intersected with, contributing to its wealth and its regional might. The archeological sites that I've discussed today are representative of a wider regional picture that's revealing important findings beyond the scope of the Caravans of Gold project. However, there are limits to what archeology span can tell us about the past, and we must look elsewhere for clues about what's missing. Many of the most highly perishable materials from the medieval period have not survived. Things like cloth, leather, and paper are almost completely absent at archeological sites in Western Africa, though we have strong evidence that they were part of this world. For instance, Arabic language manuscripts were certainly brought across the desert in the medieval period along with the Islamic faith. The Spanish manuscript on the left is a latter copy of the 12th century biography of the prophet. We don't know when it was acquired by a family in Timbuktu, Mali, but it's part of a deeply rooted Islamic culture there. The book on the right by Leo Africanus 
a 16th century Muslim diplomat who was imprisoned over several years at the court of Pope Leo X, tells us that the book trade was the most lucrative commerce in Timbuktu, where the cost of a book could be twice as much as that of a horse imported from North Africa. Remnants related to the practice of slavery is also noticeably absent in the archeology span of the period. The descriptions of North Africa in the Arabic sources frequently reference the enslavement of individuals from beyond Islamic lands. The 10th century Mesopotamian scholar Ibn Hakal, who drew from his experiences traveling in North Africa and Spain, for instance, took note of, quote, slaves imported from the land of the Sudan, West Africa, and those imported from the land of the Slavs, Christianized Eastern Europe. Enslaved individuals who survived the harrowing trek on foot across the Sahara Desert from West Africa were forced to work, frequently as agricultural laborers, household servants, miners, and soldiers. In Morocco, their descendants called themselves Ganawa. They have forged a unique identity that includes performing distinctive music for healing and public entertainment, as on the left. Iron clappers and a stringed harp are among the key elements of Ganawa music. On the right are early drawings of these instruments in an 18th century account by the Danish traveler, George Hust. And this is the harp and the clappers. In her 2009 TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie describes the importance of telling many stories about people and places. She relates how reducing a person or a culture's story to a single narrative strand robs people of dignity. Caravans of Gold follows this call to reform how Africa's history is recounted. In the exhibition, fragments of many kinds were brought together to tell a story of medieval Africa. There are the material fragments that lie at the heart of the archeological endeavor and the textual fragments from Arabic accounts that require another type of excavation to discover and interpret. There are fragments of forms, practices and techniques that have been passed along through time and that with care can provide some insight into the past across that distance. In addition, there's the work of specialists today, each invested in a topic that provides a viewpoint into a larger picture. This project has brought together individuals working in many fields and professions. In the exhibition and on its website, several of these dedicated individuals are featured in short videos that bring you their stories in their own voices. Each contributes to an expanding picture of the past, but this story is not complete. My hope is that new fragments in time will continue to emerge, whether from archeological sites or other sources, and that our vision of Africa's medieval past will continue to grow. For those interested in further resources, there are several listed here.